o'clock here. So welcome everybody. It's Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee. Uh, just double check it is that's the right time. So it's just past half past ten. Uh, we have a quite a bit of business in front of us today. First item on the agenda. I've um saying that this this uh, committee this will be uh, getting recorded today. Just I think I need to, to make that clear for the for the sake of listening purposes. Okay, first item on the agenda is said and apologies. Thank you, Chairman. We've got eight members present this morning. Apologies from Councillors Ronnie and Ingalls. Uh, Councillors Gobi currently not present. Thank you. Uh, declarations of interest. Do we have any declarations of interest? Ten years link from Councillor Johnston. As, uh, on, the, on the matter of the uh, shop front grants, um, as an operator of a retail unit in the Freestown Centre, um, that really is the extent of my interest in that. I didn't receive any funding or anything from it. So, thank you. It's up in front of us today as well, but I, I take it in, in as far as governance concerned. If that particular shop front came up in discussion, then it would be yeah. right that clear. I would advise there would be no requirement for you to leave, as you say, that it's quite a say a tenuous link. Yep, thank you. Thanks very much for that. Minna, the meeting 21st of September. Do we have a, do we think that's a, a true reflection of what happened on the day? And if we do, can we have a, yep, no dissenting voices, so we can agree that. So on to item number four, which is a rips of the report. Who's talking to this one? And is it, so Rona, do you want to say a few words on that one, please? I'll say just a few words for the benefit um, of uh, our new members that uh, we do have powers to undertake covert surveillance uh, as a local authority. Uh, it's an activity that has uh, not been, uh, it's not been in the numbers that it used to be, and that's the experience of a number of local authorities. We now go for a lot more covert methods. You know, we've got community safety officers with cameras. Uh, now, etc. Um, it's still something, though, that we we have in our a power in our armory to do something. Uh, if we needed it, typically things like fly tipping, um, some planning issues have been uh, used uh, for, for that purpose in the in the past. We are under quite a strict regime about reporting. We have to report to policy and resources committee once a year about a RIPSA activity and also review our policy on it. So that's been happening. Uh, following the last inspection we had, the inspector recommended that we'd also provide quarterly updates to uh, this committee. So this is a, a quarterly update basically saying that there has been no activity in the last quarter. Uh, given that I don't expect us to have any RIPSA activity uh, and certainly any great numbers, I'm asking a uh, committee's permission that I will simply confirm to you all in writing if there's no activity and not have the need for a report, but if any activity is authorised in the previous quarter, you will receive a report on that. Graham. <coughs> Chair, um, interesting, uh, interesting about the investigative powers and that. Obviously, you know, we have investigative powers through Westminster, through the, the whole office and that. Uh, obviously, with the council going, uh, obviously, with the community safety team, uh, I've got, um, they can uh, put, up put up cameras for fly tipping and bits and pieces. Does this actually extend, like, so, like the, the Home Office of Power to extend, like, tapping phones and uh, have the powers to um, um, go through uh, emails? For anything of that nature, uh, that we would go down the route of a, a police warrant if there was anything that was required in, in that. It, it's more about um, a, a more a physical surveillance um, in the sense of you know, we would perhaps in the past even have had uh, people uh, you know, going into shops pretending to be other people to buy alcohol or to buy a fake, even in the days of fake sort of DVDs and, and and fake perfume, things like that, that would happen. We do have one issue, uh, where is that a lot of that trade is now going on online. So yes, uh, this would give us power to do things such as set up fake uh, Facebook names and and, and uh, persona, so that you could actually start. Uh, engaging with people who were doing the illegal activity. So there is a little bit of, of the 
uh, the cyber activity there, but on the whole, it tends to be about uh, photographs, cameras, uh, and following uh, activity at, at certain locations. Any other members? Rona, but it's been brought to my attention, CROPS is the terminology that's been used, which I think is Covert Rural Operational Surveillance. Have you heard of that? I mean, my understanding is that the Council undertake that, which is a way of, it's probably self-explanatory, but uh, my understanding is it's still a, a, a covert way of uh, surveillance. I just wonder if it would come under this Act or not. I'm, I'm not aware of that, but I can certainly make inquiries if you'd like to give me a, a bit more information, because it's certainly my understanding any covert activity should be uh, authorised under this procedure. OK, we'll come back to you through a different guy. So when it comes to our recommendations and the decision we make today, we'll be asked to be note uh, the purpose of the, uh, the RIPSA, you could say, uh, as per explained at paragraph 3.5, and at 2.2 we're asking to to agree that uh, the members of this committee will be informed in writing on a quarterly basis if there has been no activity and a report will only be prepared for the committee when surveillance has been authorised as per paragraph 3.7. Can we have an action in a minute in regards to crops? Is what, and I'll, I'll give I'll feed, feed, feedback that information just to see if it is. I mean, my understanding is we do undertake that type of surveillance, but clearly it hasn't been. Uh, it's different from what you've explained slightly. Yeah, so just say, is it our remit or does it actually lie with the police or where, wherever it is? Okay, are we okay to agree that? Everybody okay with that? Is there any dissenting faces? So. Excellent. Item number five. Annual complaints process. Uh, is this... Is it Aaron? Aaron? Spot on Aaron. Could I ask you just say, say a few words about Aaron just whenever you're ready? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I think the only things uh, to really add to the report. Um, firstly, Recommendation 2.2, just to confirm that as well as uh, publishing it on the, the website, we also make it available through customer service centres with hard copies, and it's available uh, on request. The performance data itself, um, very much a, a mixed bag for 16-17. Uh, we can see some improvements in some areas, uh, in some areas um, not so much, and um, we need to improve on those. For example, our average response states have got better, we're taking less time overall to respond to complaints, but at the same time, in relation to stage twos, there are a number of cases where, in individual cases, we're not meeting the, the 20 working days. So the improvements of the overall picture, we need to see those go into individual cases uh, as well. In terms of now and in the future, we're really focusing on a lot of improvements to the, the process. So we've got the corporate hand, uh, complaints handling procedure, uh, we've got requirements to meet that for the SPSO, and obviously for the, the people who are engaged in that process. But in terms of internally, uh, whilst we've done a lot of research across uh, other uh, councils, we find that we've got a very, we've had a very good process in place, but it very much relies on the availability of staff. And there's no doubt uh, staff availability is reducing, and we need to improve and review the process, which we've been working to for the past five years. Uh, we need to make it more efficient, we need to uh, allow for more flexibility and we need to get a system that works uh, for us as well. Um, we've obviously lost our complaints officer in the last year. We've also lost uh, information management complaints manager. So we're really looking at the process of how we do things, giving the services more flexibility to get the, the further improvements going on forward as well. Thanks for that, Aaron. Thanks very much. Any members? Karen, you're first. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> a couple of months ago, I um, phoned up Head of Service, so I did to make a complaint about an incident that had happened, and I got a, a letter back within two weeks of apology. So it kind of correlates with this. It was dealt with at stage one, and it was dealt with, you know, in the appropriate time. But following that phone call, what I wanted to do was check out what the complaints procedure is for counsellors, um, and I was unable to find out, because I just wanted to make sure I was following the proper process, I was unable to find what the complaints procedure is for a counsellor. So, so the question is, in regards to what is the, the complaints process for councillors? Yep. Rona? OK, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a, a che an old chestnut, this one, I think, to, um, led by uh, our former councillor Geddes uh, in the past about a complaints process for, 
for members. It's always been my view that members have not required a complaints process in the sense that you know you are the council, you have a right to go to any director, you've got a right to go to a head of service, the chief executive if necessary, to receive uh, information and hopefully to resolve uh, your issues. Um, I do, however, uh, know there is a mood for us to, to look at this, so I'll be quite happy to look at if any council anywhere actually has a complaints process for members, what does, what's the remit of that, what does it involve, what's in and what's out, uh, and how it works. So I'm quite happy to do that and bring back a, a report to, to this uh, committee um, in the spring. Well, thanks very much for that, Rona. Thanks for that reassurance. <coughs> Any other party? Yes, it's just on 3.32. Um, about social work, it says here that the new social work complaints handling procedure no longer includes stage three, and uh, which is the complaints review panel. And I just wondered what the impact of that has been. Is it? I mean, is that all right? Uh, is it a good thing, or why did we take out stage three? Um, what was the reason for that? In, in essence, it was the uh, SPSO who removed the, the requirement for the stage three process. Um, the thing combined, obviously, there's a lot of resources in relation to stage one, and stage two, and stage three. Uh, and I was actually at a, a meeting just a couple of weeks ago, and the, there was a, a lot of uh, reasons why, generally. But it comes down to they they saw that across the three stages, the outcomes really changed. And obviously, when you see a three-stage process, that's internally. So, well, obviously, with the complaints review panel being independent, but then you'd have a fourth stage going to the SPSO. And in reality, it never really changed the outcomes within the four stages. So it never saw there, there being the benefit to, to do that. So basically, you go through one stage, two stage, and the likelihood is that you're not going to change your position then. So the, the stage three wasn't being in any benefit. Okay. So sorry, just to, to reassure members that you know that there still is, there still is a stage three but it doesn't lie with us anymore, it lies with the SPSO. So, you know, we deal with stages one and two, and then it's straight to the SPSO, uh, and that's thought to, you know, have given actually uh, more recognition. As, as Aaron said, we weren't seeing any changes at one, two, three, particularly anyway, but just to reassure that people do have that right, but they have actually a quicker right uh, way now to get straight to the SPSO with their complaint. OK, Patsy. Graham? Oh, Chair, thanks. Obviously, looking at page 28 and 29, obviously, with uh, customer satisfaction with complaints and services provided, there seems to be a lot of genuine concern still out there regarding um, how the complaints are made, how they're dealt with, the satisfaction forms are provided, various things like that. This needs to be robust because the NHS and uh, someone in British Army makes, a, uh, makes a, a complaint about an officer or someone within, within, the, within the battalion. These things are taken pretty seriously. So we need to be quite robust in how these forms and evaluation forms are set out. Many other organisations and sectors do have a, a robust system and process. It needs to be tightened up here. Uh, these comments um, uh, regarding on page 28, 29 uh, are quite alarming. Uh, it really needs to be strengthened up, and hopefully this committee will take this forward because uh, uh, generally, as a member of public, as an elected member, we should be taking complaints seriously and we should be dealing with them in the proper and appropriate, appropriate way within the timescales. So I hope that can be taken on board. So we're getting nods in regards to that. I mean, I did pick up on page 28, 29, I think it was 30 as well. There were some interesting comments. I think it's as good a way to describe them as any in there, but it kind of gives you an understanding of the frustration when somebody isn't satisfied, whether it's at stage one, even just getting a, a written response back. So... Uh, what I did pick up on as well, but nobody else has picked up on yet, as far as the, the bulk of the complaints seem, seem to be heading towards the EEI department, Economy, Environment, Infrastructure. So I wonder, is uh, could you, have you got any more background in regards to that? What the type of complaints are? Just a little bit of a, do you see, see uh, do you see how that's reflected, please, Alan? Yeah, I think generally, certainly, the, uh, obviously, this is coming a period where I wasn't involved with uh, the complaints necessarily, but in the last uh, six, seven months. Um, it, a lot of them relate to planning. Um, uh, whether people are un unhappy with the decisions, whether they're unhappy with the process, and, and obviously there's a lot of interaction in that process of officers to get back to people, etc. And that's certainly where the bulk seem to come from in the, in the last six, seven months. That correlates 
exactly with the type of it's made about customer service and that's what I'm just kind of wondering it's a customer service has been received by the planning department but I mean I would imagine it would be on the planning department as well but that's what you're you're talking about there so building control as well actually Graham Chair, obviously, we just mentioned here about the complaints and, and the nature of complaints is the E and I. It's, it seems to be always roads that I seem to be dealing with um, from from that department, plan department, building warrants, and that. It seems to be it seems to be these things. Maybe we should be getting the director in here and you know and, and explaining why these complaints are not handled in time. Because then the day it's the director of the services they, they, they're at the foot of the, the, the head paid service. They should be dealing with the complaints. It's like the colonel. You got the colonel and the, the battalion. You don't go to the corporal. No, I mean, I think hopefully we'll pick up on that. We've we've picked some uh, choices in regards to review, scrutiny reviews, and planning and build controls, one of them. So hopefully, we'll, I would imagine that the director will come in front of us or the head of service, whoever, at that point. So, Rona? I think, you know, Aaron has, has been, has started a review, and you know, he's, he's, what he's found out already is already, is, is very interesting that I think we've got quite a bureaucratic way of dealing with our complaints. We have a fantastic process. But actually, what is the purpose of the process? It's to resolve someone's issue and to do it quickly. So we're going to try and, at the first stage, you know, encourage officers to deal with things, you know, pragmatically by picking up the phone or having a meeting rather than getting people into this process. That then just means we have delays. And I think the other thing that I would like to to bring forward um, through scrutiny would be. That we, you know, do we actually learn the lessons of our complaints? Do we actually take what people are complaining about and then turn that into a service improvement? I think that's something that we could work on. Ian, then Graham. I'm just wondering if we know uh, how many of these complaints originate from the same individual. Do we have? Is there a history of individuals making repeat complaints? Um, yeah, that, yes, there, within those uh, statistics, there's certainly uh, cases where the same person has made more than one complaint. Um, I wouldn't say it's sufficient enough to make it hugely significant, though. No. Uh, when you, for example, I'm maybe saying that the same person's maybe made half a dozen complaints, I don't think we would have uh, um, yeah, much more than that from certain individuals. So it sounds like it's maybe not in balance when it comes to Graham. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and back of what Rona said, yeah, I quite agree with, with that about looking at these complaints, but we don't, without getting into micromanagement of this, we don't know what the complaints actually are um, and what they refer to. And that might be quite useful to have some insight into that so that we can then look at them or, or decide which department is, is causing the most concern. And uh, until we get that, we can't really get to the nitty gritty here. But, but I don't want to get involved in answering the complaints. That's not our job. But it would be might be useful to know what the what they relate to. Oh, thanks for that. I mean, I think uh, there is a lot of detail in here. I think in this report, it's quite detailed, and I found it quite honest. That's what, that's when I read it. I felt it was quite an honest uh, and open reflection of what seems to be going on. Uh, there is obviously seen as an improvement, you could say, as we go forward. Come back to Karen's comments earlier and what Ron is saying. I was surprised that uh, when I found out about Karen, it was happening out, out with my, my, myself realising that she'd been treated as a member of the public in real terms, but absolutely the outcome was really good. Whether that led to service improvement, I know I don't know, because it was over and again, it was a quick response. It was satisfied at that point, and I, hopefully that's the way general members of the public are being treated. So. And I mean, I do think you're right enough. How do we actually scrutinise this properly when it comes to uh, understanding? Ultimately, we're here just to approve the the complaints report, so we go forward to SBS and, and so on and so forth. So, I think I've got Malcolm coming in first, then Wally. Uh, thank you, Chair. Is this is quite clear? I mean, it is a customer service issue, which is uh, something I have quite a bit of experience over my working life, and to to find a a 20 working day response with only a 28% success rate is actually really quite an alarming statistic. And I, I think that's verging on crisis level. Another experience that, that, that I think that I've learned as well is for every complaint you get, you've probably got another nine people at least out there with a similar problem that just don't make the effort to actually put the complaint in. And if we're reading through some of the responses on page 28 and 29, some of the 
rather short and glib answers that members of the public <coughs> received are uh, not acceptable. So I, I wonder what sort of uh, training regime do we have in place for complaint handling? Because it's a very important part of the of the of the council. In terms of the, the training in the past, I, I think it's referred to, and uh, Ronan's mentioned as well, it focused very heavily on process and, and procedure. Um, and I think certainly going forward, my intention would be to focus on the flexibility and the actual handling of the complaint. It's all well and good having a procedure and a process to meet that procedure, but it comes down to that, that customer service um, interaction with the person. So we want to see the phone being picked up. We don't want to necessarily see every case that uh, it's just a letter shoved in the post type of thing. So we want to see far better improvement. And that's the, the focus on the training, certainly going forward. But we would concede that there's, there's been gaps in that in the past. So just to kind of clarify the process for, for me, um, do you have uh, supposed complaints handling specialists or as each directorate got a customer service function within it that uh, someone then who actually understands what's going on as opposed to someone who has just in theory been trained in dealing with uh, awkward members of the public um, so every department has a uh, complaints of the coordinators so they undertake the admin role if you like updating the system uh, logging and allocating etc and then we have the complaints handler, which typically is the, the business manager. Um, if anything, there's maybe a potential issue of inconsistency in each department of how involved they get. <clears throat> in the case of some of them are very, very involved, in which case their, their workload is significant, which causes issues in itself. Um, generally, I would say most stage ones, for example, are actually responded to by the relevant or the answering manager. Uh, whereby they will do the letter slash get in contact with the individual. Uh, the complaints handler would have more involvement at the stage two process, whereby they are bringing in place an investigating officer, a responsible manager, and definitely playing, playing more of a coordination and leading role in that. Wally? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm always intrigued Chair, uh, you know, in 3.2.5, when I read something has been partially upheld, it's almost like being half pregnant. So it is, you know, either, either the, the complaint is upheld or it's not upheld. Uh, and and it, it just always intrigues me how it can be partially uh, in that respect and, and uh, in a different life, uh, you know, even if the Complaint to a tribunal uh, was found, the process was flawed uh, uh, and found the outcome may not have been uh, any different. But I think this is just a hide uh, behind when you see this coming up in any complaint as it's partially upheld. Uh, I look at page 31, Chair, and uh, I'll, I'll come back. But Rona made reference to we have a bureaucratic system. I sometimes wonder if we've got any kind of system. Uh, when we look down at children and young people in lifelong learning, social work services, social work staff were reminded of the importance of communicating with service users and their families, even if situations where no information can be shared. Uh, it's, you know, elementary almost. Uh, and we, uh, throughout yeah, my, my lifetime in, in local government, it's almost like uh, officers taking uh, file notes. In social work terms, it seems at times as if nothing's taken or fed back to the individual, and it's recognised in there. But then we turn to, uh, again, what Rona refers to as a bureaucratic system, page 27. Uh, if your complaint was upheld or partially upheld, did we... Uh, we reassure that you would uh, take corrective action to prevent the issue you raised happening again. And you look at the percentages down there, in the high percentage. If corrective action was identified, how satisfied are you that the service has done what it said it would? 38%. 
either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied, and 35% skipping over it. And I make the, the question of Rona and, and Aaron, are we just skipping over, you know, getting by stage one, getting to stage two, and then people just, you know, ditching the whole idea because it's so bureaucratic and they don't feel they're getting to his total satisfaction out of our uh, complaints procedure. So, so that would be my first point. I'll come back on my second point, if you don't mind, Chair. Aaron? Um, I think, firstly, in relation to uh, partially upheld, uh, it's a national discussion. Uh, they, they still talk about what does that mean. Uh, this is from the SPSO. So it's, it's very much on the acceptance of failure. So have we done something uh, wrong? And in some cases, we've maybe done some things wrong and maybe not done others. There's also issues whereby you might have six different points of complaint and we've upheld four, but not two. And the SPSO, the, this is the, the discussion. So, you know, it's the overall content's not fully upheld, but it's not fully unheld, except unheld. So it's the kind of middle ground and that's the national conversation that's uh, still ongoing, to be honest. In relation to the bureaucrat process, um, for members of the public, um, we don't necessarily think that's the issue to, to them. It's the internal process um, in terms of the involvement of potential single point of failure individuals, uh, whereby if they're out, out with the office, we could have issues with that slash the, the support. So it's the internal process we think is the more bureaucratic issue as opposed to the basic the procedure from the members of the public's point of view, not to mention the fact we can't really change that procedure given that that's the model um, complaints handling procedure defined by the SPSO. So it's definitely, certainly if, if members of the public do see that more bureaucratic side, then that's the part that we hopefully would see improvements on, focusing on the changes to the internal. In, in, ter in terms of the, the process and the system, I think it has it has benefits for the public that they they know what they've got a right to expect, and that things will be dealt with, and it will move through, and ultimately they've got the right to go to the SPSO. It's also right for us as an organisation that we have a way of dealing with people, because, you know, because whilst the majority of people do actually uh, you know want something changed or altered, there's all, there's also the odd person who, you know, nothing will satisfy and we've got to have a way to, to move them through the system and move them to the SPSO as well. However, I think where we could make a lot of improvement is actually uh, with people who have a genuine grievance at, and at the start of when they first make that contact, we shouldn't necessarily just try and push them into a system of letters and stages. You know, at that point, officers should have the flexibility and, and should have the nous to, to try and resolve it there and then, so that we're not then, a, you know, absorbing resource actually going going through a process. The second part, Willie. Yeah, Chair, it's three point three, three point three one, uh, and uh, Patch referred to earlier, and that's the new procedure where social work now on stage one, stage two, and it's automatic. Uh, that it goes to the SPSO. Uh, is there any way as a, an audit committee or a, a scrutiny committee uh, that we know how many of these cases uh, go through to SPSO and what the outcome uh, of those cases, not just to, to in social work, but the, the number that are going to the SPSO and how many have been upheld? Uh, in that respect. That's my first one. The next one in that same paragraph, and it's more a governance issue uh, in terms of the new system, the health and social care, uh, and the IJB, and there doesn't seem to be any complaint system uh, in, in place there, and if it is, uh, then it's a minefield and trying to work your way through it. But the, 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 there's this dichotomy that uh, health and social care. We still have an element of social care, uh, but yet when you ask the question, oh no, that's them over there, you ask IJB, when in actual fact it's not over there, it lies with the council, 
uh, as the provider of, of, of social care uh, in, in some element. Have we got governance sorted out in this is my basic question. I would like to answer that, but I'll leave it to, and I'll put my thoughts at the end, Willie, so just make sure I've got a clear understanding of how that works. But Aaron and maybe Runa. Yep, we had the, the example literally at uh, the start of the week whereby we received a complaint which was addressed to, to ourselves and uh, through consultation with social work we, we were advised that it was a, a health and social care, if you like, um, complaint with the, the main basis being the NHS. So, for example, there's, we want to make the best for the customer, so as opposed to, yeah, it's, it's over there, we've, we've got in contact with them to advise them of the situation, to explain that to them, and basically give them the option of whether they wish to take that to the NHS themselves or whether we can do that on their behalf. But we would need to do that to get their consent on, on that basis. But I mean, there's different, I suppose, behind the scenes, there are different procedures that, that work in place for the IGB, health and social care integration, and in essence, social work, mainly children's uh, related complaints, and then their council. In terms of the performance and the, the reporting, I, again, this was only discussed literally two, three weeks ago at a national meeting with the SPSO, and most councils, and I think we've certainly been tended to do the same, is that within our report, these uh, figures are reported separately. So you would see the complaints directly under the social work procedure, under the health and social care integration, and the, the council procedure as well. My understanding, Willie, is that for the health and social care integrated joint board has got a complaints process in place, but it's in regards to the board members, because the member that they have no got actual direct employees. So, I, so that's for, for me, what Aaron's saying is pretty new in regards to the council. All right, it could work vice versa, I suppose, that way. If the council's receiving a complaint, it actually reflects on NHS, and we would take that forward. I would imagine there should be some kind of reciprocation here in the fact of the case. So if somebody complains to the NHS, it's actually a council thing. There should be, so I mean, I don't know how that would work out. It sounds like a bit of a, uh, I wouldn't say a dog's breakfast, that's a bit strong, but it could get complicated and, and, and foreseen. But I mean, think the integrated joint board, and I think Claire was actually, could have been the architect of that. She was certainly involved at the time. But the, it's, it's in regards to, to the board, the, the board, the board members. It's, 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 it was the board members in particular running about the, the complaints for the IGB. I think that's correct, Claire, isn't it? Um, certainly going back to my knowledge, and that was the, Again, that was a while ago now, um, the complaints process at that time um, was focusing on the IGB board and um, recognising that the IGB don't have any employees as such. That was my understanding, but you're talking about particular wrong about services being provided, I think, aren't you? So, that, that's certainly my understanding. Uh, go on, Jane. Yep. It, just on exactly that, I, I was just wondering uh, aloud whether or not it might be part of our future work plan that we should actually have a session on how we could make this work best, Chairman. So if we could go perhaps into an action as, as a topic that we should consider. Absolutely, Jane. That's exactly what I was going to say because it's kind of aside what we're discussing from, from the actual decision we're making today, but because of the level of discussion we've had and uh, issues that have been brought up, when it comes to our scrutiny reviews, which I think we'll, we'll be bottoming that out in January time, is that correct? So make a note. If we could, that, 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 that potential would be one of us. The whole complaints process, how it works, come back to the point that was made at the beginning, even members' complaints. Willie? Yeah, Chair, it's not just complaints, it's scrutiny as well. Uh, and we had, uh, had an area committee, one from IGB or NHS, and one from the Council. And, and, and you know, it was not, we, we, we don't know any, we, we can't answer you that one. That's nothing to do with here. And, and yet it was here before us and we, we were scrutinising our report. And the other one was when, when they were asked questions of uh, a service, uh, council referred back to IGB and IGB hasn't got back. And, and, and there's no timescales uh, in terms of scrutinising services that are provided under health and social care. Where do they lie? So I think uh, uh, Jane's suggestion is eminently sensible that we try and put uh, 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 get a grip of this and, and put a handle on it uh, because it's it's all over. It. And to me, you described it well—a dog's breakfast. Thanks, Wally. I mean, I think out with this meeting, there is certainly a high-level discussions being had, which will come to fruition in 
either January or February in regards to governance, complaints, and so on and so forth. But it'll all feed in nicely to what you're saying, I think. So, as it comes to recommendations, we, we're being asked to approve the appendix. Can we approve that? 2.1 and 2.2, we're being asked to approve the publication of the report on our council's website, if we can approve that. And 2.3 is just for noting, uh, which is just to note the approved report will be forwarded to the SPSO as detailed in paragraph 3.2. But can we also note as well that as part of a review, we'll have this particular complaints issues. If we, I see Claire's took a lot of information down in regards to the issues that have been raised. So from Integrated Joint Board to how we absolutely operations functions uh, in regards to the, the, the complaints handling uh, process itself and actually the, the members, they, they have the, we'll look maybe wider across Scotland, what is the other complaints processes in place for uh, elected members. Right, item number six. This is a health and safety progress report, and I think we've got Paul and Sue here. Is that right to, to speak to this? So, a couple of words whenever he's want, whoever's speaking. Thank you. Hiya. Um, this report provides an update on corporate health and safety activity against the corporate health and safety plan. Um, recommendations you asked to review the performance in the main body in the report and in Appendix 1, which is the performance report for covalent, oh, that's on Pentana. Uh, and also to scrutinise the exception report in Appendix 2. You'll note that there's good overall performance with 18 out of 20 um, items on target, with two exception reports which are shown in Appendix 2. Um, in the main body report, we've gone through the performance of the corporate health and safety um, team, which includes the CASM standard communications, the audit programme, um, please, just a correction, I overcommitted myself that I would get a report out for the today's committee. I just want to say that the Arts and Museums audit will be issued tomorrow. It's not quite issued yet, that's just me being overcommitted, I think. But it will be going out tomorrow. Um, workforce development as well is in Appendix 3 um, for the training delivered via the Lifelong Learning Centre. Um, you will note we have got a good news story on the RIDOR information that has gone down. However, please note we're not complacent on this because even though accidents and incidents, down, incidents have gone down, then we have produced incident statistics that are subject um, for further review by the incident reduction strategy to identify hotspots in certain areas within the council to look at. Um, also, you'll notice there there's fire authority action letters for three um, for your information. Getting on to the actual exception reports. Um, the first exception report is regarding the Joint Safety Committee. We target ourselves to do four uh, Joint Safety Committees. This is the formal consultation in the Council with uh, um, elected members and unions and uh, Council officers. Um, following the revised elected membership of the Joint Safety Committee, um, as agreed at the previous uh, June and September Audit and Risk Scrutiny Committee, the, G the Joint Safety Committee was in fact indeed held as per the report on the 8th of December to get back on track with our quarterly um, formal consultation process for that. Um, the last exception report is in respect to the incident reduction strategy. We have, um, uh, due to reduced capacity within the corporate health and safety team for this period, we have, um, slow the progress has been slow in, in, in this, in this um, element. Um, what we have done is we've actually, um, put four, four action plans are available for review with on, in the corporate health and safety, um, uh, manual within the connect. What we've done is we've set up an incident reduction strategy review group that looks at all of these four action plans and, and, and tracks the actions within them, um, so that there's scrutiny. Um, and also looking at um, taking further, you know, just because there's a, a directorate working group, uh, a corporate-wide working group, we are looking at further actions um, uh, to track the actions already been put in place. Sorry. Also, the vehicle subgroup, the action plan has not yet been um, issued available for that. Some work, some quite quite amount of work has been done on the vehicle subgroup, um, but and the next meeting is available on the um, January and that's been led by the fleet manager. Okay, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, thanks so much for that. We'll any members got any questions in regard to this report? Wally, I've got maybe one as well. Yeah, Chair, and, and, and looking at the date, uh, this is the 14th 
the report would have been written and passed ten days before this, which would have been the fourth. Is that correct? So, so this uh, predated the actual Joint Safety Committee that we met on the 8th. Yes, that's correct. Right. Because there were issues that were raised at the Joint Safety Committee that, that, that don't appear here. Uh, and I don't know if we, you know, the committee should be made aware of some of the concerns that were raised at that Joint Safety Committee that are not reflected in this report. Uh, I'm looking at page 41, and, and, and Sue saying that we had not met as a joint, uh, or, or we didn't even reach the target of four per year uh, joint safety committee meeting. Uh, but there was the issue also about the number of workplace safety committee meetings in, in the departments that did not seem to be taking place. And the other issue that came up was on temperatures uh, and, and how we record temperatures uh, in all the offices and, and, and workplaces, classrooms, etc. And, and we were sitting in a room when, when the question was asked. There was a, 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 an illustration brought or a, a thing like a... Uh, the... We've got one here. There wasn't one in that room we were in that day which really uh, highlighted the whole issue. Uh, and I think that was an action uh, that was taken in the Joint Safety Committee. But it wouldn't be in this report because it, it was post-dated, this report. I just wonder how we deal with issues like that in terms of issues that come up for this committee to be aware that all is not well uh, in terms of our processes, procedures, and even policies. Okay. Um, this report is based on corporate actions. Um, in addition to this, each um, directorate needs to report their own directorate performance at service committees. And indeed, the holding of directorate health and safety working groups is subject to a performance target and is included within the business performance reporting requirements as part of the service committees. So that's something you might want to look at within the, the actual service committees. Um, Yes, most um, most of the directorates have now reformulated the Directorate Health and Safety Working Groups, apart from CIPL. Um, but the, the, uh, and due to structural changes, previously they have been held separately between education and social work. The other aspect about temperatures, yes, that was raised um, by the unions at Joint Safety Committee, um, and the action from Joint Safety Committee is um, flagged to property services for consideration. Um, and for further consideration and to be brought back to Joint Safety Committee. Thanks for that, Sue. Uh, I mean, there was other things brought up as well, but I just say it's looking at the purposes of this report, why it's here, and I think taking on board what's, uh, what Sue said in regards to the uh, at the service committees and corporate committees for that matter, because there's quite a few things that were brought up, which when I read this, I thought, well, that's relevant, why is it not here, and so on and so forth. I mean, but it does, I mean, look at the actual purpose of the report. I mean, one of the things that's, the health and safety in regards to members. I just wondered what what do we do in that in regards to members? Because there's been a couple of incidents. One in particular where a, an MP, obviously from Birmingham area, was killed uh, surgery. I just wonder risk assessments. I mean, is it something that members should be aware of uh, how they how they operate when it comes to surgeries or, or even meeting people? And I just that was not in here, but clearly the report. It's maybe no, it shouldn't be here. But I just wondered. I've never have ever been approached in regards to that as well, but it's 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 clearly it's in my mind because of things that have happened f uh, further afield. Chair, I think you're absolutely right there, and, and this has been discussed recently, and there's going to be uh, a coordination of um, meetings with political groups to look at those issues on a group-by-group on group basis and, and to look at uh, loan working and to look at other areas, including uh, risk assessments, uh, and to provide some good guidance. There's been recent workshops on that, which officers have attended, and we want to bring back the digest from that to make sure that we're looking after members in the same way as we, we look after staff. Thanks for that. Thanks so much. Okay, taking into consideration what we're here for today, can we? Uh, we've reviewed at two point one. I think we've done that as per appendix, and actually we've uh, we've scrutinised the exception reports as well as per appendix two. Item number seven. Ten lot of reports. Thanks so much. 
Who's got leaders? Is Kevin leading these? Yep. Kevin? Give me a chance to get up. Kevin, do you want to say a couple of words to this, or would you prefer us just go into questions, what's your kind of view in regards to this? I'm in your hands, Chair. Okay, members, I'm in your hands. Would you like Kevin to say a few words to these reports first, or would you rather just go straight to questions? I missed that. Straight to questions, okay. Kevin, straight, just let's show we've read these reports, and straight to questions. So up to members, then. Our first one, internal audit, is, is around about the Capital Project Review in Langham Primary School. Uh, 3.2, I'll just start with Kevin. 3.2, one of the things I did pick up with that one was that uh, it says there that uh, the school estate management team comprising the office and education officers from the strategic property services had influence on the delivery of the school projects during the lifetime of Langham uh, Primary School project. Then it goes on to say this group was was disbanded when the, when the new project management arrangements were brought in three years ago. But then it goes on to say, and this is a bit of, uh, what's relevant to me, and we did not have access to the records of this group. Well, I just when I read it, I thought, well, did you want to keep in mind different bits, kind of different things that have happened over the years? So I wonder, it comes back to record, records management in real terms. Is this a common occurrence um, through through the council, in your view? Is it, was it unique to this particular project? Because obviously access, being able to access the correct information retrospectively in regards to a project is very important. So... Any, anything in regards to that, Kevin? Thank you, Chair. Yes, it was unfortunate that when we came to reach this point in the audit where we would like to have seen those records, the last officer who had been involved in that group had taken retirement. So um, it was unfortunate. Um, yeah, the Schools Estate Management Group was an important group in its day, but it doesn't appear to have had structured record keeping or kept files consistently, you know, so there's no real archive there. Um, I think we we had the choice of either spending quite a lot of time trying to track down information about what the group had done or work around it, and that's what we did for this audit. We felt in the end that the files we had access to were sufficient. There are a couple of questions in the audit report where it would have been useful to have had um, the information, uh, particularly, for instance, around the decision to uh, build a new school at Langham, whereas previously it had been marked for refurbishment. So a decision was taken by the SEMG, uh, it was reported to Education Committee, but no kind of explanation was given. It was just the group of officers come to the conclusion the right thing to do was to build a new school. So we'd have liked more around that, for instance, because uh, we went from, as I say, a refurbishment approach to a new build approach um, with no real sort of lead-in on that. But at the end of the day, we dealt with what was in front of us, which was a new school was built, and, and that's what we focused on. So although there, some, there would have been some useful information, I think, coming from um, SEMG records, we did not feel that the audit was impaired by the absence of that information. Thanks for that, Kevin. Any members got any other questions or points they want to make in regards to I mean, it's there, the conclusions are there as well. We have read it, and so there's nobody coming forward with that. So we'll go on to the next one. It's the leader program. Any, anybody got any points for what are in regards to this one? Feels like I'm in an auction here, <laughs> trying to get bid of. No? Any points you want to make and bring to our attention, Kevin, in regards to this one? No? No, that's no, another. No. Okay. That's it. Go on, thanks. Um, Kevin, it was 4.8.2 um, in, in the issue where there were four cases in the sample where additional grant was paid in respect of a contractor who didn't provide the lowest quote. Um, is that an issue of uh, compliance with procurement, our own procurement rules? I'm on, I'm on the right bit, aren't I? We're in, we're in, we're in leader, are we? Yep. So this is the Shopfront Improvement Initiative report. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, you've gone into the next one. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I've advanced. We'll just move right on to that. We'll just move right on to that, because I know we've got a few questions in regards to that one. Jane. 
Um, yes, that was 4.8.2 um, with respect to the leader, um, to the um, shop front, front issue. Um, it, this is a question, I suppose, about whether or not we were compliant with procurement. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on, on why that could happen. Um, yes, I think that's really where we are. So, Chair, we're, we're, we're making the point here that there's a level of complexity which perhaps had not been anticipated previously, but it relates to the fact that people submit quotes for work. The core rule is that we wish to fund on the basis of the lowest received quote, but that the person, the shop commissioning the work, the business commissioning the work, can choose who they like to do it. So in the sense of procurement, the procurement lies with the person, the business that's that's doing it. So there's no there's no issue for the council in terms of who they get to do the work. It's a matter of we would fund it on the basis of the, the most cost effective or lowest quote. It comes to a situation where in some cases um, the work can take longer to deliver and become more complex. So sometimes people have come back to us and said the costs are higher than we'd anticipated. What can you do to help? And in the situation when they've used the lowest quoting provider, it's fairly straightforward. You know, I think members would agree it would be perfectly reasonable to continue to support the project in some fashion. So if there's additional works to be done, which still qualify in the context of it's a shop front. And secondly, the cap on an individual payment being £5,000, as long as it fits in with that, we could accommodate that. It gets slightly complicated when the person that wasn't the lowest quota is doing the work. And that's all we're doing is we're reporting in that there's a level of complexity in here and we have no concerns about that. It's just there's a sort of complication in here that perhaps hadn't been anticipated at the beginning of the scheme. I think it helps illustrate that, that this scheme, which was a member-led scheme, member-driven scheme, um, ha had levels of complexity which perhaps members weren't aware of at the outset. Just before I've been Patsy and can you remind us who actually led in this? Who actually led in this? Can just just from memory? It's economic regeneration um, department ran it uh, at members' request. Remember this came back in twelve thirteen, I think. Members allocated a sum as part of revenue budget setting for the project, and they wanted something brought forward on this, and then Economic Regeneration developed a programme, brought it back to committee, had it approved, and then progressed the, the scheme after that. Patsy. Yes, I, I thought this made really very concerning reading, and I'm looking at 4.1.6 on page 2, <coughs> and there's 10 bullet points then there, all of which flag up fundamental um, shortcomings within the system, if I'm being perfectly honest. And um, I just would quite like somebody to go through them all and explain and explain them. Because there's no exclamation. It just gives you the problems, but it doesn't say why they happened, who was responsible, and what was done about it. Fundamentally, Chair, I hope that members have got the message from this report, which is that it was not well-resourced. And that, I think was a consequence of the way that the thing came about. As I say, it was a member, very strongly driven by members. Members were very keen something be done on this. They allocated funding, they expected results, and they wanted results across the whole region. And th that, that presented a number of difficulties for the department concerned. So it wasn't separately resourced. It had to be done from within existing resources. Um, there was, I think, a, a genuine worry at the beginning that the demand for this could be overwhelming, certainly based on members' representations at the time, that there was great enthusiasm for this scheme and that um, there was a great desire out there to achieve this outcome, which everybody signed up to, that it could be very overwhelming very quickly. In the event, it turned out that the complexity, I won't use the word bureaucracy, but it's an alternative word, um, in terms of meeting members' expectations, which were that this money be specifically spent on this purpose and uh, they wanted results. Setting up a scheme that could deliver that with guarantees and so on was, was quite complicated. There was a, a great reliance on the quantity surveying firm that was appointed. They have contributed to this significantly, the success of this program. I think they did a great deal to help make it work. Um, 
The council had the funding, but it was a question of being able to apply that and to maintain members' interests and, and members' wish to make sure that this funding was used appropriately. So that, that's where the complexity came. The administration at the council was not particularly strong, and that's what we're saying in these bullet points, is that um, there was a, some weaknesses in that. None of them particularly critical. The, the QS effectively acted as the backstop on this. The QS made sure that the scheme and its terms of reference and so on were adhered to pretty well. Um, so overall, we're not blowing a whistle on this and saying it was a dreadful scheme. It's just that the in council's own internal processes were a bit weaker, but that is to do with resources and that is to do with the way that the project came about. So it's, there are some good messages in this report, I think, for the council, um, for members in particular, which is if you wanted to take this scheme forward in another form in the future, you need to give careful consideration to certain aspects of it. One of which is, for instance, is it better? And the scrutiny committee earlier this year, I think, agreed that it probably would be better to focus this activity on localities where better support could be put in, where results would be very visible. You'd get improvements in townscapes uh, that were very visible. The problem with that is you can't do everywhere across the region at the same time. So that, that's one aspect of this for the future is that I think group schemes are probably indicated as being um, more successful. They have a higher overhead than just somebody applying for a grant and there being a process and then receiving the money for that. Okay, so, so the, you know, there are resourcing implications for this. So it's, it's really for members to consider, I think, in the next scheme that's coming. This scheme was a good scheme. It delivered good outcomes. It didn't progress at the rate that had originally been anticipated, and it's revealed uh, certain complexities that will need to be given careful consideration. Um, and the support for it within the council, if it's to be done with council support, that will have to be funded as well. And if it's to be funded externally with the QS, again, there does, the, you know, there's a requirement for a building professional input into this sort of thing. Um, that doesn't come for free. So there are costs associated with this which in the end, you know, members need to be mindful of if they decide to go ahead with the scheme in the future. I just have to say one thing, Chairman, that this was a pot of paint, uh, half of being provided by the council, half being provided by the owner of the shop front, for argument's sake, to put it in very simple terms. Somehow or other, we as a council have made it so complicated that it, it didn't, it flagged up huge problems that didn't really need to be there. And I think we need to look at how we do help um, help projects like this go forward without smothering them in red tape, because that's what we've done here. We've just put too many forms and too many things in, 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 in place for people to comply with, when actually all we wanted them to do was smarten up the shops. It was a simple idea that turned into, grew like topsy and, and seems to have turned into a, a nightmare. And it's flagged, I mean, Flagged up things like, you know, original documentation was not there, you know, planning consent was frequently missing. It's not good, but it shouldn't have happened. And what I think we ought to do as a committee is find out why it happened. And I don't believe it's all about resources. I think it's how you use your resources, not about throwing money at it to make it better. And if this was a, a, a project coming forward through um, budget procedures, there should have been a what do we get? We get a template thing to show us how it's going to be done. There should have been a risk in there, and the risk should have been flagged up that we didn't have the resources with which to do it, and I don't think that was there. My question, Kevin, was rhetorical, and I remember being involved in this heavily as a policy development that came through. Uh, we were in administration at the time, but Patsy's highlighted the points, particularly around about the last thing we expected was to get some simple shop front uh, development to enhance the area, re make the, the the town, the town centres, wherever it was, had quite a few, few site visits as well. I think it's part of the previous uh, scrutiny committee with a few, few site visits around about to see how it was working. Another point, but I mean, 4.1.6 does, does not make good reading when you read it. You think, oh, is it because we're being too bureaucratic? Maybe we're checking. We've got to have our checks and balances in place. That's absolutely important. But a lack of record management, and just, there is a lot of things in there that I, I, I just feel uncomfortable with. And it goes back to, I think, maybe the point that Patsy, and I'm only saying this to thinking aloud here in real terms, obviously goes back to the department that was actually dealing with it at the time, but 
I mean, I would have thought, going back to the policy development that was put, proposed to us at the time, there was no identification that this would cause any stress in the department at all. This would be a straightforward policy development, could be implemented and it could be, it would, should, again, it would be successful depending on uptake. And it did, it took a long time to get off the ground, but certainly I, I agree with parts when it comes to 4.1.6. 4.1.6, yep. Uh, didn't make good reading and uh, it just, it's how do we then go forward and actually on the back of this take this particular, these, these flaws forward. Jane. I don't mean to sort of um, prolong the debate too much, but really, um, you put your finger on it. We, we've got as elected members to say to the council, if you um, if you want a particular policy development, and this is a council's, you know, the council's policy or the administration's policy development we've decided as a council to have, um, we, we've got to be clear that it is then fully resourced and embraced by the actual um, uh organization doing it whoever it is um and i i i think there was a bit of foot dragging um because maybe we did not resource it sufficiently and we weren't told that at the time i don't believe we were absolutely told i remember sort of thinking that it wasn't happening why wasn't it happening everybody was quite startled that the money hadn't been spent um and i don't think we were perhaps challenged enough or challenged ourselves to say look that's not enough that won't that will only do a small amount. Do you realise that? I think people are quite happy to, to know that, but they need to know that to start with. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know from the Andrea and Estelle, Chapel Cross, beyond Chapel Cross workers were involved and there was a resource there, but I think there was less across the, the rest of the region. Graham? Yeah, I mean, th this was a policy which was, I was budget lead, I think, in, in back in those days, and uh, this was a policy that was uh, unanimously uh, welcomed both by the public and by the council. It was going to tidy up our shop fronts, improve our, our streetscapes, and uh, it, it was, Jane's quite right, it, it, the money was very, seemed very difficult to spend it, to get rid of it. Um, and I think we, as a council, we were wrong in, in maybe under-resourcing, but over-complicating the issue, Patsy is quite right. And it doesn't read well. You're, you, you're having lost those set of papers, I've now read Ian Howie's, <laughs> it doesn't read well, and uh, I think we, we, we should hold our hands up here and, and agree that we did under-resource it, or the department didn't, uh, made it too complicated probably, because that wasn't, I don't think what members originally intended to happen, was to make it as complicated as that, but it, it, it grew like topsy, and uh, the turvy it fell over. I can't remember the exact figures, but for a moment it was something like 500k over three years, or it could have been more than that, some other, but I mean, surely if we needed somebody or a member of staff to actually run that, that allocation should have been attempt, somebody temporarily put in post, took it from that capital sum and made it run and run with it. And for the multi projects were involved, what a single person could have run with that with their eyes shut and made it work, so to speak. So it didn't, it, but it didn't happen. So therefore, I think it's more an operational issue, but, and I think I'm glad, helpful that you've raised it, Can you've raised it, it's a, it's a clear identify, clearly identified within the, the, the internal audit that you've done, so it's good that you've raised that. And the, the, kind of, all this stuff's been pointed at the actual department itself. And Wally, then, we'll, we'll go to the next one. Yeah, Chair, I'm listening to all the remarks being made and uh, a bit under-resourced and over-complicated, and this is a retrospective report we're looking at, I take it, you know, on how we did. And then reference was made in terms of moving forward and we in Stranor have got the, the car scheme uh, and uh, perhaps it's the, how would I put it? Uh, it, it seems to be suffering from perhaps what has happened here uh, because it's one that is resourced and uh, I don't know how many uh, businesses have applied and said could we have, you know, could we move this uh, under the car scheme and monies that have been allocated and uh, the last uh, explanation that was given was it was lying with, with legal and legal uh, were taking its time to determine you know the whole issue which may come into the, the realm of being over complicated because up to a, a fortnight ago nothing was moving and the other thing is that elected members have very little say 
either uh, at, at committee level or indeed local level, uh, it, it's done by officers in terms of allocation, looking at it. So, uh, uh, as I say, we, the car scheme instrument might just be the result of what is all in this report and what lessons were learned from the, the audit of, of the numbers. But, you know, we've gone from one extreme to the other uh, in, in Stranoir where nothing is being done and yet we've got it resorted. There's an officer out there appointed and it's not moving. It's a, the, the excuses are uh, that legal's dragging its heels on it. Now, now whether that's sorted out yet, I don't know. Uh, and this is taking one retrospective and looking at it. How do we move forward? Well, it doesn't look as if we're, we're capable or, or able to move forward on all the issues that are placed before it. Thanks, Wally. So, Chair, sorry, can I, can I say? I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm giving the committee the impression that this has not been a successful scheme. You've I'm not. Sure. No, Kevin, stop. It, you, you, absolutely have, you have not. You absolutely have not done that. And that's why I say this is just an internal report, and I think it's good that these things have been highlighted. It's not, uh, and there's no criticism towards yourself in any way, shape or form. In fact, it's the very opposite. No, I know, I know you, you've, you've audited it, it's very opposite. I would think it, it, you, you, you and your department would actually be commended in the level of information that's here, the depth of the internal report, and obviously with a lot of questions that are coming, coming back from that, uh, to say the least, so no, and I mean, and Wally's right that he's bringing something in which Baroko he feels passionate about, but it's a wee bit set aside in a way for this, and it's, I'm, I'm not really want to take Wally's points here any further here, because it's not really relevant to your internal report. But I would imagine it'll come back at some point, because Stranar was, I was at a meeting in Holyrood last night, and Stranar was even mentioned there, but without that, will I rather just move on, if you don't mind, just in regards to... Uh, absolutely, Chair, and I listened to you, but, but it was the ref reference there in how do we move forward? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's all. I, I'm not asking you to get in on, it's no, just no. in moving forward, uh, no. learning the lessons of the past, that, that doesn't seem that we're doing it. I'm sorry to come back to you, Chair. The grant scheme has been successful. If you have a look at page five, it shows where the money's been spent. There were some challenges in the scheme, which I think have emerged through the audit, but the scheme itself, the grant scheme, was well received and has been successful. So members needn't feel this was a waste of money or it didn't meet its objectives. It did. It was a, a challenge for the department to deliver, and they didn't always meet some aspects of that challenge, but the bottom line is the scheme overall has been a good success. I got personally involved with, with two or three constituents who were, came up with the challenges that you've actually identified throughout this, so it does reflect what happened on the ground. I see that myself with my own personal experience, uh, uh, Kevin. So, no, that, we understand it was, a, it was a success by the time we got there, but I think three-year plan, took about 18 months, two years to really get started, but then when it did get, did get rolling, it did get completed, completed quick. Right, internal audit report, the main financial systems for 2017-18, housing benefit and council tax reduction. Anybody got any comments in regards to that? I've got no takers in regards to that. Okay, we'll move on. Thanks so much for your for your audits and thanks so much for your hard work. At number eight is external audit report issued. We've got John Boyd here today to speak to this. We'll just let John get get sat down. You'll be wishing that he went first. <laughs> We'd ask them you later. Right, away, John, it's over to you then if you, you want to say a few words. Thanks a lot, Chair. Uh, this uh, report summarises the output, um, a part of our output from our external audit in the summer of 2017. Um, as part of our, our annual audit process, um, we look at IT general controls. And um, although we didn't find any individually significant issues, um, as part of our audit process, we can uh, communicate those uh, to to the committee. Um, just as an overall, there's, there's, although we've identified individual points there, it's probably th our three main themes. Um, one is around the sort of review and monitoring processes in place, particularly across privileged uh, user accounts, such as uh, system administrator accounts. Um, there's also uh, a, an element there around the the uh, use of sensitive information, so called it a point there around the use of USBs uh, and how uh, the council ensures that there's no uh, inappropriate data extracted. And the final point is around trading 
So while individuals receive training on information security um, and data management when they when they initially join, it's about keep making sure that's refreshed, um, which is particularly important in an area where it's continually evolving in terms of the level level of risk. But as uh, reported in the covering letter, um, we didn't consider any of these uh, observations to have a material impact on on our on our audit approach or represent a significant risk or significant uh, deficiency to the to the council. But happy to take any questions. Thanks so much for that, John. Thank you. Open this up to members. There's no takers at this point. I mean, I think one thing for myself was just it was accessibility for elected members to. For me, when I read this kind of stuff, it's as being able to access information at the right time, the right place, where we can to actually understand committees. I reflected back to a committee I was on where somebody had lost uh, their, their employment, had been terminated by the council because of the access to certain information, uh, which they shouldn't have been accessing. And this, but unless you're actually involved in these type of committees, members of the council, you don't actually understand some of the checks, balances, and procedures that are actually in place. And I mean, I don't know, for for instance, how many people would access my information, my emails, and so on. And that's that's what was for me. That's the trigger point. That's what that's what stimulated my my new reading this. And okay, well, it, they're all showing green. Nothing really to highlight. You've got obvious things that could go wrong there. But I think, for an elected member's point of view, that was my point. Was how do I actually understand if MD is actually accessing information that it shouldn't be? The measures that are in place, the stops, checks, and balances are they adequate? So that's what. Obviously, you're at a different level because you're in, you're in. But so I mean, that's that's all of my comment. I don't see anybody else raising their hand. Unless you've got anything to say on that, John, or not? I mean, part of our review wouldn't focus particularly on you know members, members uh, data in, in particular. Um, where the focus of our work is predominantly around the uh, financial statements. So any a uh, uh, systems access that could have a material impact on on the accounts. Um, we do look at the IT general controls, which is a kind of broad range. So it will look at you know, user access, and as part of that, we we'll look at the use of uh, data, but not particularly around sort of specific around members' um, information. Graham, are you want to say a couple of words on this? Graham's an actual expert when it comes to this. So Graham Markerum is here, just for the sake of the recording, he's got to come and say a few words. Thanks, Chair. Um, just by, I suppose, way of reassurance to members, um, the external audit that we've just had carried out has picked up on a number of procedural defi deficiencies that we've had. It hasn't actually highlighted any major risk um, to council systems. Uh, and from that perspective, we apply the same rules across all systems, including email. Um, so uh, your, your comment earlier about somebody else seeing your email, that while it's technically possible, it's impossible for any other user of the system. Um, our system administrators do have that privilege, um, but it's only used on a very ad hoc basis if there's an issue, if you raise an issue with us, and that gets approved and signed off before anybody can get that access. So th there's a very strict regime, um, particularly with system administrators, who are the people who have um, elevated rights um, uh, and, um, as it said, the passwords are changed regularly. Um, there's a review of who has those um, rights carried out on a regular basis. What, what the audit here has identified is that there are some systems where that's not formally done every six months, but it's done on a, a reactionary basis. For instance, if we get a new user in, we would then check everybody else at the same time. And what the audit's asking us to do is to do that formally without any sort of trigger. Um, so, in other words, do it every six months. One of the things I picked up was, without getting into too much detail, uh, I think it was the fact that those external users from to the council were able to access information, and they'd been using it. I think people had even moved departments and different things, but they still had the authorization to go in. Uh, I thought that was a bit of a risk, to say the least. But uh, yeah, chair, absolutely, um, and we've picked up on that. Um, so. We now have, as part of this audit, introduced a new compliance regime or a new um, monitoring regime that says if somebody's moving or leaving the council, that the, there's now a process in place where that's automatically noted to all the system owners. 
for them to update the records or update system privileges. Is that a manual physical thing? Is that a software that actually does that? Um, we've, we've written a program to actually notify that the information comes out of iTrent once the, the, um, the termination or, or move of the contract is done, and that's now automatically sent out. Um, whereas in the past, you read it was manual. Okay, okay, thanks for that. Anybody else got any questions? No, thanks so much, John. Thanks so much, Graham, for your, for your answers. Hmm. Let me find where I am. I think I'm under any other company of business. <laughs> okay, we've got three reports under any other company of business members, just so you'll be here at three o'clock, you see you're aware. <laughs> now, I'd love to <laughs> wish you all a very Merry Christmas. There's no other business scheduled for today, and a very, very happy and prosperous New Year as you go in. All the best, everybody. Thanks for your time today.